Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. As you can see, we're coming to you live from Digital CPA. Barry, Lisa, it's fantastic to be with you. We've got, a, we've got an audience here with us as well. And one of the things that I love about when we do these town halls in person together is that we get to connect with many uh, town hall attendees. And we, we do every year, we do now, we do the town hall at Digital CPA. We also do them at the AICPA council meetings. We do them at AICPA Engage. So Barry, Lisa, I'm gonna share a couple of the themes in a minute, but some opening comments from you. Well, the connection is important and we've talked about uh, we've talked about how important the feedback online is and, and how we you know, take that feedback and build it into all the activities at, at the association. And I, I think when we have the opportunity to be with people uh, personally, you get to renew relationships and, and you get to so hear things in a different context when people talk more, you know, in that spirit. And, and maybe the most important thing about the connection is that we, you know, we pride ourselves in this event of being connected from a practical perspective. So, if we, we hear great feedback, but we also hear if we're missing something, and I think that's really important. Absolutely. Lisa? I, I appreciate always when someone comes up to me and says, I've been watching you online for three years. I feel like I know you, but now I really get to meet you in real life. Um, so I've had several of those uh, instances come up during this event in particular, and I just want to thank you for the community and, and again, to reiterate Barry's point about the feedback, how important it is and how much the support that you all have given us over the past three years has really made an impact on me and our team. So just a little bit about Digital CPA. We've been holding this event uh, for a dozen years. We bring a group of really progressive firms that are working on transforming their practice. We initially focused Digital CPA on the client accounting services area. It's expanded well beyond that, focusing in tax and in the audit services uh, as well now. In particular this year, uh, we're talking a lot about the dynamic audit solution and the transformation of, of audit. So this is the themes that we've been talking about over the last day or so. Um, we, Barry, you and I had a great opening discussion on generative AI. We had a keynote from Pascal Finette, and even this morning, we continued that discussion on, on Gen AI. So we, we're gonna share with you some of the resources uh, that we've been providing to the digital CPA community we're continuing to talk about the transformation of the practice areas. Again, Lisa, that's another, another uh, area that we have a lot of resources that we're putting together to help firms um, you know, navigate these new capabilities and really drive uh, increased client value. We're talking about capacity. Um, Technology is playing a big role. And Barry, one thing that we say here is that you know, there's not as much of a talent issue at Digital CPA because the investment of these firms are making in technology is helping them both recruit people and actually also deliver the work. And then finally, leadership. Leadership's critical, and we're gonna have a great discussion uh, with our current chair, uh, Corey Ramsey, as well as the chair of Digital CPA, Lindsay Stevenson, uh, at, the, at the end of uh, today's town hall. So we're gonna kick things off, as we always do, with the DC and profession update. Then Lisa's gonna be providing some technical updates and then we're gonna get into that discussion with Okori and Lindsay. So Barry, kicking things off, um, we're not in Washington DC right now, um, but it, there's continued gridlock there and a lot of focus on what's going on uh, with potential, a potential government shutdown. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's sort of a lull period for DC in some ways. I mean, if you compare what's happening in DC now to the, the, the months prior to this, several months prior to this, it's, it's really all about the funding of government and it's about political posturing because we're less than a year away from uh, you know, a presidential election. And you know, there's still some feeling out in the House because of a new speaker that's there. And really all things and all eyes are on, on the funding. And what, the, what the, the temporary funding has what's called a laddered approach, some of it expiring in the middle of January, some of it expiring the first week in February and then continued expirations down. And it's gonna be interesting when they come back from the, from the holidays in December, uh, when they come back to Washington, what the sort of tenor is in an election year as to what 
what people see the politics of shutdown of government to be. And you know, people make different decisions on that. Some think it's a political advantage if things are shut down and they can blame it on the other side. And that's just a really, a really important part. But for our perspective, it's really about IRS funding. As we click the calendar and we go into tax season 2024, um, we're really concerned about the implications from an IRS funding perspective. That the funding of the IRS would probably fall in that ladder in February 2nd. What happens on the January 19th um, element of the first sort of ladder of funding and ladder they broke the funding down into to phases basically. Um, what happens in January will be indicative, I think, of what might happen in February. Now, the issue for us from an IRS perspective is um, we just, on, on, in fact, on November 27th, we issued a letter to all members of Congress um, and, and really to all corners of the government saying that we are we're greatly concerned about an IRS shutdown or a skeletal workforce at the IRS. We made some very concrete recommendations on what the IRS can do, do now, and do if there is a shutdown. And we also made a recommendation that we believe it would be appropriate for the IRS to, to be able to use funding from the uh, Inflation Act uh, of a, a, a little bit over a year ago. That was the IRS's position a couple months ago. Office of Management and Budget said, no, 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 you can't do that. We made the point that, um, we made the point, in fact, that that they should be able to do that. That funding would keep the government operating, um, or keep the IRS operating, I should say. And in fact, with this, um, with this sort of blo or, uh, op ed actually from former IRS, most recent IRS commissioner, Charles uh, Chuck Reddick said, and his first sentence says the, the American Institute of CPAs um, got it right, basically, uh, in his op ed, and, and that this funding is critically important for the collection of revenues, but the the, the sort of the rational administration of our tax system. So we've made recommendations, for instance, on penalties, that if there is a shutdown that affects the IRS in any way, that there ought to be an automatic procedure that the due date on those notices would be 90 day, would be, would be pushed back to 90 days from whenever the IRS funding is restored or the, or the IRS continues to operate. We made specific recommendations, for instance, in departments of the IRS and where if there is a skeletal crew, where some of those people would be. Like, for instance, the, the chief uh, counsel's position, because that's the area that they actually issue guidance where there becomes confusion in how to apply a certain thing during tax season. They can get guidance out still if they have that in that process, and that's obviously critical to people uh, appropriately filing their tax returns. So it's sort of a two-prong approach, yeah. three-prong, really don't have the shutdown, but secondly, if you do have a shutdown, the IRS ought to be able to use the money to, um, to continue to operate money that's already been appropriated to the IRS and under other appropriations activities. And then if you're gonna have a skeletal crew, these are things the IRS needs to be prepared to do, including having all their systems in tip-top shape so that as best the system can, it can work in a shutdown environment. And we'll continue to update the town hall community on the December 21st town hall, and then our kickoff one early. in early, January. So Lisa, actually in the technical updates, we, we have a number of, of DC related items. Yeah, we do. Um, some good news came out on November 20th when the IRS announced that once again, they were gonna delay the um, decrease in the filing threshold for 1099Ks. As a reminder, that's the form that reports out transactions through third party payment networks like um, PayPal and Venmo. We were concerned last year at this time that a lot of taxpayers were going to get these re reports that they were not expecting, that they didn't know what to do with, and that there was gonna be a lot of chaos and confusion. And at the last minute last year, IRS delayed the threshold. This year, they've given us a little bit more advance notice that they're gonna delay that threshold again. So for um, 2023 1099Ks, the threshold is going to continue to be 200 transactions and $20,000 of um, mon money flowing through these payment networks. So what they've also done is given us a little bit of a clue for their 2024 tax filing season strategy, and that is more welcome news. In 24, they're saying they're gonna use it as a transition year and change the threshold 
not quite down, to, or not keeping it at the 20,000, but at 5,000. So hopefully that will give us another year to uh, continue to advocate for a permanent higher threshold than $600, because we just believe that's gonna throw chaos into the system. One caveat, that does not in any way change the requirement to report taxable income. So I always have to say that. Um, this is just the reporting mechanism out from the third party payment networks. And, and Lisa, that issue about what would be the thing in the future also wraps into a lot of other issues we have out there, like the Section 174, um, you know, restatement of an extender that has expired, um, some issues associated with the, what we're proposing, a different way of doing individual tax extensions called the SAFE Act. All of those things are dependent upon a piece of legislation that has a tax uh, chapter in it. We, the last town hall, we were a little bit more positive on that there might be something that pops up in that before the end of the year. I think as we sit here today, we're a little less positive or maybe more negative than we were at the last town hall. Things change in, in Washington quickly, it can still pop back up. I remember when we were going through PPP or you know some of the, the um, pandemic related legislation, we would always say, eh, it's not looking good. And then 24 hours later, something had changed and, and it would be there. So it's not over till it's over. And we are continuing to, to advocate for the, the fix in 174 and some of the other things that I know are important to the audience. Um, some more good-ish news. I'll, I'll put a big qualifier around this one. We've talked a lot on previous town halls about beneficial ownership information reporting, what we call BOI, and um, FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, a, a department within U.S. Treasury, announced a change in filing for new entities created in 2024. And that's a really important caveat. This delay in the reporting deadline only impacts entities that are created in 2024. So instead of them having um, an unreasonable 30-day deadline for getting in their BOI, they've got a unreasonable 90-day deadline um, to get their filings in. So again, this is only for 2024. We are continuing to advocate hard for a one-year delay in this BOI reporting because there is so much, um, frankly, confusion in the marketplace. We still don't have a reporting form. We still don't have a reporting system. So there are still rules that FinCEN needs to release in order for us to get some clarity around what that reporting is gonna look like. And that's not out yet, and it is December 5th. So this all goes into effect January 1. And um, uh, just as a reminder, we've got a ton of resources that I'll point you to um, if, if we can look at the next slide. It's got a little bit of background or information. If you are not familiar with beneficial ownership, we've got some education resources that you can access. But at high level, this is around anti-money laundering reporting requirements that were issued through legislation a few years ago. And existing companies, so if you exist on um, January 1, you've got until the end of December 2024 to file a beneficial ownership information report. If you have a change in any of your information, you have an unreasonable deadline of 30 days to file updated or corrected information. And again, we talked about if you're a new entity. There are exceptions. We've got about 23 of them. Um, the, the one that I'd call your attention to is that large entities um, with more than 20 people in the US and gross receipts of over 5 million are exempt from this requirement. So this is really targeted at smaller businesses. And I'll also call your attention to those uh, pretty substantial penalties for failure to file or fail to, failure to file correctly. Again, we have a lot of great resources in that link that you'll have in your slides when you download those and um, a lot of, of conversations still ongoing, but keep in mind, we don't have the answers yet because we don't even have the forms yet. So just hang with us and we'll continue to develop what we can. Lisa, a lot of questions coming in, and this is something I know we'll be addressing at the, uh, the, on the December 21st town hall, but just related to beneficial owner information being an unauthorized practice of law. So that's something we're gonna have the Aon team with us. We'll be talking about it. Is there anything you'd like to 
I will just say that it is a um, facts and circumstances test. And some of these may just be a simple reporting. And some of them may be more complex. Some of them may be advising, which is where some of the complexity will come in. So it is, again, not cut and dry. We're getting conflicting information from um, state bar associations. So again, I think more to come on that. And they're referencing some things that have been sent out by some insurance providers. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that um, in greater detail so, on the 21st. But our insurance provider has said, you can do this work provided that there's not an unauthorized practice of law determination in your state, which is a state-based issue. Yep. And there's just some things to consider in putting things in engagement letters and others to protect yourself in that environment. Uh, there, are, there are some, some insurance people out there who's saying, don't do this, this is bad, or whatever. Um, our position is that we need to take a more holistic look at that as it relates to the profession and in the public interest, frankly. The profession is the ones that have this connectivity with this information more so than lawyers ever will. And it's, uh, we shouldn't just dismiss it on that basis. And Barry, there's also tools that are being developed to help with this. So exactly. a, lot, a lot occurring, a lot of questions coming in right now. And I'm going to um, point you back to that resource center because the AICP member insurance program risk alert is linked in that resource center. It's got a really good look at some of the, the things that you need to think about if you're going to perform these services and um, ways to mitigate any potential exposure. We're also hearing that firms are talking with attorneys about how to meet the needs of their small business clients if there is some, some concern about um, UPL in a particular state. It yep. is a fluid situation. If you, uh, you know, just stay tuned with us as we continue to work with FENSEN to advocate for that delay and also to um, see what we get when we get, actually get to see the forms. And Lisa, besides the, 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 chain, the new companies or changes, we will have 2024 to Correct. Kind of put these processes in place potentially put technology solutions in place and answer all of these different questions. That's correct. The risk is if there's yeah. a change in ownership right. information, like an expired driver's license, the, the details are kind of scary. Okay, we got a reminder from the IRS about written information security plans. Another one of our favorite acronyms, this one is WISP, and they have the cleverly titled um, Careful Whispers. So good, to, good for the IRS for showing us some humor there. But as a reminder, this is a requirement under the um, Graham Leach Bliley Act. And I just wanted to simply put the rem reminder out there to you as you enter into tax filing season to make sure that you've got your WISP plan um, up to speed. And we've given you a link to the resources that we have within the tax section. One more thing I wanted to talk with you about is to let you know that um, just at, in case you haven't seen it, we've been talking about this um, for a, a, a while, but the revised statements on standards for tax services go into effect January 1, 2024. These are the enforceable pra tax practice standards that AICPA members are required to comply with. And through the course of this revision, we've basically taken seven um, previous standards and grouped them, regrouped them into four practice areas. Um, then we've, um, so the first one is just a general SSTS. The second was a, is around compliance oriented standards. Third is around consulting oriented standards. And then the fourth is around um, representation, tax representation. So regrouped seven into four and added um, three standards related to data protection. So tying back to that WISP requirement that we have, how to rely on tools, what the standards are, and then again, new standards around tax representation because when these were originally drafted, they, that wasn't factored in. So you'll have a link in the slides to the resource center that will give you a lot more information. And there's a, a great Journal of Accountancy article that you can look for as well. Thanks, Lisa. Well, now let's uh, bring Oh, Corey Ramsey, uh, the chair of the AICPA up, uh, along with Lindsay Stevenson, who's the chair of Digital CPA. There we go. 
Well, we're looking forward to this discussion with both of you. A lot of transformation and leadership discussions occurring here at Digital CPA. So Barry, I'll let you, you know, set up the, uh, the first question. Yeah, and Akori and Lindsay, great to be with you. And, and Lindsay, thanks for chairing this great conference as well. Akori is the, is the chair of the board, both the, our Global Association chair and the AICPA chair uh, from the state of California and works on the corporate side. Uh, he works for um, uh, Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest medical providers, medical services providers in the, in the country, and is really a very significant acquirer of CPA services. And, and he's in a large company, but he's going to share with you some thoughts about how he sees the relationship uh, between um, a, a buyer of services and C the CPA profession. And he's had a lot of experience this year traveling around and interacting with members in all shapes and size companies and firms. And so we look forward to Corey to seeing or hearing some of your uh, thought processes in that and, and sharing some of your thoughts overall. Uh, thanks, Barry. And it's a pleasure to be here. My first time at Town Hall and excited to be here. And Lindsay, again, thank you for this great conference that you put on. Uh, I, I will tell you that um, th when we think about you know, what the kind of services that we provide, we procure a lot of you know, different services in, of organizations of different sizes. Right? I mean, we're a practically $100 billion organization, but we will acquire, instead of just working with the big four or the larger firms, we also work with some of the smaller, I'll call them scrappier organizations because they can move faster. They can get things, you know, the T's and C's done, so the terms and conditions, and they can move. And, and so when we're looking at what we're doing, at least in my space of, you know, Sarbanes Oxloops, you know, really kind of a compliance function for finance, how do we still add value, right? Be, because it's not just about making sure that we're meeting the deadlines and that we're making sure that we've got the right controls in place, but still being very much advisors to you know, organizations. And so when I think about some of the challenges that like, we're dealing with or, or other organizations that I you know, engage with, whether it's you know you, you're dealing with you know how do you go to market or what are some of the you know the things you're dealing with in terms of um, of resources right? making sure you have the right talent in place to handle the different issues that you're dealing with or you're looking at um, you know, just transformation how do, you have to have right skill sets to help do that in the organizations that can um, really help you invest in that space are going to be the leaders of the day. Right. So, so obviously that's really how we're, how we're kind of looking at it. And, and that, again, isn't, isn't size specific. You can be a small organization and still be very impactful in terms of how you, you really look at uh, supporting a large organization. Yeah, I think that size specific point, it, it, it applies in all different sizes. Um, we, had, we, had, we were with a Corey and he had an opportunity to speak about this before um, the CEOs of the 80 largest firms in, in the country. Um, and the feedback from that, and I, I think it is really applicable to um, all of the participants here, particularly those in public practice that are on the town hall, that this, as a Corey, as you said, whether it's tax compliance or whether it's CAS compliance, you know, from a financial reporting perspective or, or some form of assurance, audit or otherwise, um, it's really how that, from a buyer perspective, really how that extracted value is there. If you, if you had to peg it a bit, um, is that value discussion greater today than it was five years ago? Is it about the same? What, you know, what's the trajectory on this? Oh, for sure, Barry, for certain. I mean, where maybe a few years ago, it was about, well, you just you know, performed the services and as long as you did a good job, it, people didn't pay as much attention. Now, it, because the, you know, it's, just, it's just harder for, to perform the work that is needed, it's really getting to be more of a value proposition. And it's a discussion of are you able to provide not only great service, but also really helping me solve problems, helping me think through different issues that I'm encountering and, uh, and, and being thoughtful about potential solutions. And it's not about just kind of throwing ideas that, that maybe won't work. Right in the organization, maybe like, okay, I'm gonna throw five or 10 ideas at you that you know, may or may not work in your environment. People want, or at least I know I want, and I'm sure you know others as well, that you want solutions that are going to be very tailored to your organization, your business needs, and what will work in your environment versus, will this work for five or six other different clients? Right now it's about how do I make sure that this works for, for me and the organizations that can really do that in a more tailored fashion are really again gonna be the ones that are gonna win out. And that speaks to really understanding the, the details, right? Which exactly. goes to, we talk about skill sets in the profession and, this, and Lisa and PCPS talk about 
you know, the skill sets and the business models issues, but it's really about, you know, how the profession continues to evolve its skill set factor to really drive answers the way you just described. It. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, th thanks, and Corey, uh, for those insights. So what we're sharing here is a strategy slide that many at Digital CPA know rather well when we're thinking about change management and driving a firm forward. Firms of all size think about these, these four pillars, strategy and governance. If you're running a cash practice, how do you motivate all of the partners or how do you motivate all of your staff to kind of really think about that and drive that activity um, as you're driving some tax and insurance work? You've got practice development, the fundamentals of practice development, the technology solutions, your tech stack, making that scalable and repeatable, um, having some controls over it, and then operational excellence. So Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Stevenson, I know you think a lot about this. Let me just provide everybody a little bit of background on you. You're the Chief Transformation Officer at BPM, which is a top 100 firm. You're the Digital CPA Chair. Uh, you've got a great background. Uh, you started out uh, in a single owner uh, firm and then we're in a, another small firm of about, I think, 30 or 40 individuals. You also were VP of Finance and Business and Industry. Um, I think you're part of the you know, Leadership Academy uh, and you're currently an AICPA board member. So, uh, and you've done a lot of consulting uh, with firms. So when you think about um, transformation and change management, and you think about what you're doing at BPM, you know, what are you up against? Um, and how do you really advance this program? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's fascinating because I think digital CPA is, is such a sort of hot spot for having those initial conversations. And, and like you mentioned, it's, it started with CAS right. and it was definitely focused around, these pillars were really focused on kind of creating that new service line, that new practice group. And um, now it's just exponentially grown as firms have shifted and changed, as the market has changed, as the workforce market has changed. Now all these are becoming so much more conversational from a firm perspective. So now we're, you know, our assurance team is talking about these exact same four things and our tax team is talking about these exact same four things. And it's not that it wasn't something that we talked about before, but we weren't very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Right? Compliance work fell in our laps. I mean, even still today, I think we get so much compliance work, a lot of firms, big, small, in between, are turning work down because they can't figure out how to get it all out. Um, and so now we're having to be really intentional about who are we right. and, and what is our purpose? What are we trying to deliver to the public? What are we trying to deliver to our colleagues? What are we trying to deliver to our clients? And, and so now these four pillars have sort of become the conversation piece in every decision making, going back to what we talked about from the session this morning, right. shifting from that data first to that decision first mindset. Right. And these four pillars are really what drives all of that for us. So, um, you know, from a transformation standpoint, I'm lucky enough that that gets to be my day job. Um, and, and there's just a lot of thought process around what do we mean when we say we're transforming? Are we really shifting? Are we really trying to move away from what we're doing? Are we trying to move towards something we've never done before? Answering those questions in that decision first model is really what's gonna help drive our ability to actually execute. Lindsay, so just talk a little bit more about just getting partners on board. If it's at BPM or if it's at your, how many partners were at the, the 30 person firm? There were four. Four, yeah. so, so we are, if it's a practice area you're trying to accelerate or if there's some type of uh, internal activities you're trying to accelerate. Yeah, I think, I mean, this goes back to the change management piece. Um, you know, we've talked about change management forever as a profession, right? How do you do it well? Um, and we have always focused on the process part of change management, which is definitely critical, but we haven't done a great job of focusing on the people part of change leadership. And really, honestly, nothing works when your people aren't along for the ride. Um, and the very first question, I think any of the models that you use for change management, there's a bunch out there. Our firm likes um, ProSci, we use ADCAR. But the very first thought process is, are people aware of it and then what's in it for them? If you don't overcome those two things, whatever you're working on, whatever you're trying to transform is irrelevant. Because at the end of the day, we, human nature is to be comfortable and do things that we're good at. Nobody wants to do things they're not good at. 
So when we shift to something new like generative AI and how we would use that in our practices or reimagining our business model for the workforce, those things don't work if we don't really sit down and think about what's in it for our firm, what's in it for our colleagues, what's in it for our clients. If we don't define that and get everybody talking about the reason why, we're never going to get there, right? I mean, that's just like you're vomiting things at people and saying, hey, do it, and they're going to do maybe one or two of them. But at the end of the day, the people are what drive our ability to, to transform. I'm going to come to Lisa. Compensation? What do you, did you, does <laughs> compensation help? Compensation always helps. I just I, <laughs> I want to expand on the uh, on the what's in it for me aspect of it because when I when I moved into industry, um, I thought because I said so was a good enough answer for you to follow my rules and, and requirements. And it's not. It doesn't work with your kids, and it won't work in your firms or in your your businesses. So again, being intentional about the the how this is going to help your team members live better lives and you know then just walking them through what the process looks like i think that's really important and focusing on the fact that words matter mm -hmm. you know just just being clear and, and intentional in your in your messaging i think is another huge component of change management and what you both articulated i could have advanced the slide uh what is this strategy slide we have on on change management uh, Lisa, one thing I'd like to say, it's 10 a.m., you know, on the West Coast, and we've got 8,000 people dialed oh, in. Oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> thanks, that's thanks for everybody joining us this early in the morning. <laughs> uh, Barry, um, change leadership, uh, transformation. Yeah, there's a lot of science on it, and, and uh, Lisa and Lindsay's comments are right on. I, I'll just give you an analogy that I think ties into that, and, and this is something that we used when we had a particular big project inside the organization um, about a decade ago, there's a lot of, how do you get these alignment and, and to just deal with it in a visualization standpoint? And, and there's, there's a lot of science written about it. And you think about it as the elephant and the rider. Um, you know, elephants are a, a species that actually wants to be cooperative. They wanna do things in a, in a constructive way. Um, they can be trained to do things. They can be motivated to do things, maybe not with salaries, but with food and things of that nature. Uh, and the writer is sort of the person who's leading the, the concept of whatever change that is. And, but, and the reality is, is that, that that writer has to take steps to persuade, convince, empower in a lot of ways that elephant to go in the direction that that writer or the board or whatever it is that has made a decision to move forward in that way. And frankly, without that, there is no way that writer can move that elephant in that direction. It's impossible, right? Because of the size and all of those things. And it's just sort of a, a visualization point of exactly what this is all about. I would just say, as it relates to the profession, we've always gone through change management. And the profession gets stigmatized in a lot of ways, very unfairly in my opinion, that it doesn't change. That's not true, it, particularly in technology, and I know, Lindsay, you've heard me say this many, many times. The reality is, is the profession is a relatively early adopter of technologies when you look at the technologies of the past. The, the pace of change today with technology, the implications, for instance, of AI and things of that nature, though, requires us to, even though we can claim some success in the past, we got to step it up even still. And firms have to step it up, individuals have to step it up, um, and, and it's just the environment is going to require that. And so while we get a good A on being early adopters, maybe not the people who were inventing something, but the early adopters, we're going to have to be even quicker on our feet to move forward. Well, Corey, anything you want to add? You know, I mean, I would, I would say that definitely from an early adoption perspective that when we look at it, for, again, from a business industry perspective, that, you know, being an early adopter will, you know, allow you to, you know, move faster in terms of having the conversations with, you know, clients about what they can maybe do to, you know, adjust, you know, their environments to what that new, you know, um, it, you know it, advancement may be. You know, when I think about, you know, what we're seeing in terms of rapid process automation or you know, gender of AI, I mean, people, they, they know the term, but they don't necessarily know how to use it, right? They don't really know what it is. And so I think that with you, if you're an early adopter, you can help the organization understand, here's what this is, here's how you can leverage it within your business environment, what you believe the benefits will ultimately be, 
and then it, because you are, you're in there when they got started, you're gonna have a leg up on someone who's coming in later to then say, well, hey, I, we think that we can do this better, we can help you. So, so the early adopters, if you're getting in there and you're starting to help you know, organizations think through what are these things that are you know, here today, but also what's coming forward and how you need to be thinking about it to modify your business, it's gonna be a big play for you, I believe. Th thanks, so Corey. So just, let's just, you know, we're here at Digital CPA. We're talking a lot about technology. So the intersection of tech and human capital, uh, Lindsay, you know, how do you, how do you think about that? How are you driving? We were great keynote this morning on cog cognitive ability and, and kind of decision making. So how, how are you thinking about that and how are you bringing your human capital elements at BPM together with all these tech capabilities? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge that we have is, is it's always scary in the beginning. When something new comes along, it feels really overwhelming. Right. You have unanswered, right, you're uncertain, and it also requires failure. And we, as a profession, really don't like to even say the word out loud, much less acknowledge that that's what we're gonna do together. Um, so I think, I think the biggest thing, you know, when you're looking at your human capital and you're looking at technology is just, you know, what we talked about this morning in the, in the first keynote, these are tools, right? They're, they wouldn't exist if they didn't make something better. No one would bother to build them. So thinking about it in the context of how does it make our firm, our organization, what we're doing for our clients, how does it make it better? And how can I leverage that so that my team has the opportunity to add value in ways that we haven't even uncovered yet. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the thought processes to have. So like when we're looking at that, I think it's really important to say things like generative AI, things like RPA, you know, even like earlier technologies. Do you guys remember when Excel came out? I don't want to date myself, yeah. but like, right? Like, so Excel launched and, and, and I, was, I, was, I was actually like, I was in college doing my accounting degree, getting ready to go you know, out into the workforce. And there was no joke conversations of whether or not there would be a job market for us from Excel, okay? Like people really thought that accountants would not have jobs because Excel was doing all the accounting work. It's insane, right? You look back at that now and you're like, <laughs> Excel is like super weak <laughs> like compared to what we have available to us now. We're going through that same process. It's just new tools. It is the same mindset, the same mentality. It is a tool to help us focus on things where we can have more value add. And that's how we need to think about technology and human capital. I think we need to get away from this, how is it gonna replace things, and more into how is it going to elevate what we contribute to the world. And that's a way better conversation to be having. Lindsay, you're very young because you didn't cite BusyCalc and Lotus 1, 2, 3. Lotus, was, <laughs> Lotus existed. I, just, I didn't want to make anybody feel way, way old. Well, the thing, I mean, yesterday we all, everybody here, we're, we're um, record attendance, 1,200 people on site, a couple hundred uh, virtually joining us here at Digital CPA. We all were getting on chat GPT leveraging that technology. One thing, it's, it's moving fast, and if we're, so we're talking about early solutions. I mean, before Google, there was Alta Vista. So things, things are moving fast, but what I, what I think we are gonna continue to do is to partner with a lot of these solution providers. And they are really um, very committed, very committed to the firms, very committed to working with them. And right now, we are. We're, we're gonna understand how best we can leverage this, this acceleration through generative AI and this us work, the firms working on the use cases, the AICPACPA.com, trying to demystify it a little bit. We're, we're gonna be sharing uh, our toolkit again on this town hall, uh, which, which is a helpful way to look at how to get started. So I think you wanna get started, you wanna know that it's, it's gonna be a journey with the ecosystem. So you're not, you're not gonna be doing this alone. One thing that is coming up here in hallway discussions is just the hybrid uh, strategy. You know, what is the right strategy? We've got firms here. I flew out with a firm um, to, to Las Vegas uh, that's 100% virtual. They've always been 100% virtual. It's an all woman firm too, which is fantastic. Uh, but we've got, so we've got a lot of different strategies uh, related to post pandemic, how, how should you function? So Barry, I'll, I'll kick this off to you so you can give us a very clear answer <laughs> what the right answer is. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to, by no the way. Pressure. No, no pressure. No pressure. So we just all want Eight, the right 8, answer. 8,000 people are watching. There you go. Don't, don't worry right. about it. There's a simple answer to this. Yeah. Um, 
By the way, my son, even before COVID, works in a 100% hybrid firm as well. So there, there are a lot of examples of that. Um, I, I, I'd like to sort of tie in the, the interaction of technologies in, 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 into this hybrid work issue uh, in three parts and just sort of tie this all together. Um, the, the intersection with technology makes the job in, a lot, in the pace of it today, makes the job of being a trusted advisor, which we use that term, harder. Um, it, it's, and Lindsay, I think, alluded to it, you know, the, the DNA of our members of our profession is to, to feel really confident about any answer that they're giving, and, 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 and that is sort of a change management element. There's a lot of uncertainty, uh, and, and we're going to have to be better trusted advisors about dealing with an array of possibilities with not maybe as clear a path that goes with it. As it relates to the human capital element, which, which includes this sort of hybrid work, there's, we ought to see huge amounts of opportunity in this. Um, it changes, it's going to change the ratios of employment in many ways. What people do, where they, you know, where we put an emphasis, we're gonna see change from thinking differently about entry level positions to more experienced and higher level skills because that's necessary in, um, in an environment. As it relates specifically to um, hybrid environments, and I've talked to a lot of firms like everybody around here has, there is just not one size that fits all. I mean, there is just so many variables in this environment. If you're niched, it's gonna be much likely that a hybrid environment or maybe a full-time virtual environment is probably gonna work because it's a very narrow niche of what you're doing and it's a rep more repetitive type of environment. Um, geography fits into it. You know, are you in big cities and you have different commuting situations versus drive up type offices? Many people say young people want to come in, yet I can bring you people up here who say young people don't want to come in. We've had panels with people who are very early entrants in the profession who say, look, if my firm makes me come in, I'm leaving because I can go to any other firm that I want to go to right now. But there are more young people today than even a year ago recognizing that from a cultural and, and teaming perspective, being in the office not just to be in the office, but to be in the office for a reason is something that's valuable to their career progression. So there is a mixed set of facts that's, that's developing on that. I know Lindsay can probably comment on this. People say, well, it's, you know, uh, leadership comes in and, and sort of the middle is what's not wanting to come in. But yet, partner, there's many partners and firms who say, I don't want to come in. I'm doing my work and I'm going to be myopic into it. So I think technology gives us an opportunity to to, to both press a pause button and to think about, in some of the words that, that Lindsay talked about, sort of a, a conscientious decision making of how do we want to manage this? How are we going to bring people in to create different um, relationships that are important, not just letting it happen hap haphazardly? And I think that that's an important, um, important part. The last point I would say is this intersection, and it does tie into human capital, is the opportunities for the profession probably have never been as great but those who want to skill set align and maybe take some risk in that environment. And it's a wonderful place to take cohorts of young people and give them new opportunities. We can go back to Lisa's discussion on beneficial ownership. What a wonderful business line in a firm that you can, you can empower a young generation with to really head that up and make it work and make it be a profit center, but also meet a public interest responsibility there. Uh, so, I think technology gives us an opportunity to look at all of those things, be, be different types of trusted advisors, sort of more consciously make decisions on how we manage, the, the, how we work with people and our staffs, and then also the opportunities that are there. So yeah, there's not one answer. Not, <laughs> not one answer, Barry, thank you. And so, uh, uh, Lindsay and Lisa. I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. What I here is that you know firms that are doing this well are doing it intentionally and bringing people together intentionally so there are again fully fully workforce distributed firms within um, the profession and they might get together the entire firm two or three times a year and part of that is um, social network building part of it is you know just some of the learning and development that needs to happen. Some of that has to be in person. And, you know, the, the, the underlying theory is it has to be intentional. P pizza and beer doesn't get people into the office anymore. It has to be 
with a with a bigger purpose than that. But the the flip side of that is um, just the need. There's a, a, a common in here in a multi generational workforce. All groups must be flexible, and I think that's really what we all just want to keep in mind is that you might need to, to stay home one day because a kid's sick or a parent needs to go to a doctor's appointment or whatever. I might need to stay home because of you know an emergency vet appointment. We all need that ability to be flexible and to integrate our lives into the, into the jobs to be done. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I think the thing um, that makes this so difficult is, is the question that we should be asking ourselves when we're thinking about how do we set up our firm to live in this current environment. We're shifting to a digital workforce, and, and what does that look like for us? The number one question is, what's holding you back? So I think what, what happens is that it's, it is hard. It's hard work to figure out how to navigate this. And so when it isn't working, it doesn't feel good. The response is not digging into what isn't working. It's this isn't working, so let's go back to what we know was working before. And I think we all need to challenge ourselves as firms in this profession, as organizations that are clients of this firms in this profession, because, oh, Corey, I think your team is going through the exact same questions and challenges that the profession is going through. And it's really asking, what's holding us back? If our workforce tells us, this goes back to the data, confirming what you want it to confirm, right, that outcome bias. But if the data is telling us our workforce doesn't want to be in the office five days a week, but that isn't feeling good right now when we try it, it's on us as an organization to dig in and figure out why that doesn't feel good. Is it because they're not making social connections? Is it a cultural issue? Is it coming down to them having access? Is it because we aren't providing real good training and feedback on a regular basis because we're used to doing that in the office next to each other and we've never really had to do it in a virtual environment? You gotta get into those causes because as a firm, as an organization, you're never gonna get where you wanna get to if you haven't defined where you're trying to land and what's holding you back from getting you there. If, if you don't answer those two things, I don't know how you come up with a solution. And that's, you know. I'll come, I'll come to you, Corey. And one thing, you can be unproductive at home, you can be unproductive in the <laughs> office, you can be unproductive on the road. So it's just like, so there's a lot of this, this idea that, no, this is where you're productive. It's, it's right. again, it's more, more complex than that. And the, all the things that you just talked about, I think, are really the, the keys to success here. And this is gonna just, it's just gonna be an ongoing discussion. I mean, in some places you are seeing everybody go, I mean, we're, we're based in New York and there's some banks that are going 100% back uh, in the office. Great, that doesn't mean that that's the answer for everybody. Yeah, you know, Eric, the, 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 I think to the point that you're making that, you know, the people who were star performers when we were in the office are still star performers today. Mm -hmm. The people that I was concerned about, you know, before, I'm still concerned about them today right, in this environment. So this hybrid environment is such that, that you, you do have to create that, that openness to, to options, but what we're finding is that uh, we're wanting people to, to come in a bit more than you know, historically. And, and part of the reason for that is that it, it is about part of its culture, but part of it is also that water cooler conversation that you might have had before that now isn't happening and that, you know, just that bright idea that might come up that you're, you're not having those kind of conversations. You do have to be intentional, you know, as Lisa mentioned, but, but it's, at some time, it's just something's hot and happening right now. And you just need to, whoever is present is gonna be part of what's going on you know, versus, well, I, I need to set up a Teams meeting or I need to set up a, loom, a Zoom or something to get the right people together. It's, it's go time, right? And, and so you have to figure out how you can, you know, can do that. I would also add on the culture front that w when, you, when you think about it, you got some people who, you know, they're on camera, some people are not on camera. You know, so you, you lose the, the, the ability to kind of see and engage, right? So you know that how is this person receiving what I'm telling them? Are they, are they aligned with me? You know, or is there a challenge? You know, um, you, Barry and I were actually on a call even earlier this week where I mean, we were all on the camera and we could see the reactions to people in the conversation and then you could ask the follow-up question, right? Because you can, you can engage because of what you can see. But if that's not happening and if people feel like, well, I don't, I don't wanna do that because you know, I, it's exhausting being on camera. Well, you know, you used to be in the office too. Was it exhausting then? I don't, I don't know, right? But I think we have to just really be 
flexible, but understand that, again, it isn't just one work environment, but, uh, but I'm finding that there's this mix and desire to be kind of both in the office when, and not just for the purpose of it's, you know, it has to be a specific purpose, but there's just interesting engaging and being present together in what you can collectively do when you're together. All right, lots of comments coming in here, Lisa. Uh, I, I have and fired lots of them comments, up. you know, I've... saying, and I think we've all said this, hey, my clients like to meet face to face, Barry. So, and that's. But I, just... I think it's important to realize that for the, there is not a one size fits all strategy. It is what's going to work for your firm. Right. We want to tell you about other approaches that are working for firms. It may not be the approach for you. That's right. But you should know that there are firms who are 100% distributed workforce whose clients prefer that approach, who are looking for a digital first mentality because they don't want any friction. They don't want to go to the post office and mail in their tax documents or you know, come downtown and try to find a place to park to get those tax documents in. So just because it's not right for your firm doesn't mean that it's not right for someone else in the profession. Yeah. And I think we have to explore the options and, and know that giant client expectations are changing as well. Well, maybe we'll have a panel on this. Uh, we just had a panel on it, but I have a panel on it with some, <laughs> with, with some firms where because you've got virtual firms, I've got you know a large uh, firm CEO in New York who's saying you know one of the things what we do is we just say if you want a office um, dedicated you come in four days a week if you want a, a shared uh, space you you have to come in three days then two days and if you don't come in uh, at that level uh, you're just hoteling so and that's and they're successful so all kinds of different success drivers. We've got a digital CPA podcast uh, that we've launched, and our first two episodes are going to be discussions uh, with Lindsay Stevenson, episode one, on innovation transformation in the digital community, and episode two will be with o Corey Ramsey. They've already been recorded, and they're available now, so thank you. Right. So, Lisa, um, do you, uh, let's jump into open forum. Is there a question uh, that you want to pull? Um, you know, there's a, there's a question in here about how management and leadership can be harder in a remote environment. And I think that leads into building out new skills. Some of us were strong leaders before hybrid broke out. And, you know, it's, it's about open and honest communications, being transparent, and building a different skill set that you might not have had to use in a fully in-person environment. So. We have some resources within PC Pass, and there's a slide later in the presentation that'll point you to some of those. We have a new talent, talent trend toolkit that'll help think about some ways that you can build a, a successful remote or hybrid strategy. Well, lots of BOI questions that we're gonna, we're gonna leverage um, for our December 21st um, session. Barry, thanks for your, your comments earlier. People appreciated that, that they know that there's you know, differences of opinions out there by some, some of the insurance providers. Back to you, um, Corey, just kind of where, where are you right now in, you know, in your firm with Gen AI? I mean, there's... Well, so, we, so we use a lot of AI in, in our work, and we, we've used AI in a, you know, for a long time. And being in the healthcare environment, we, we have an immense amount of data. Right. And so it's really about how do we transform that data to become, you know, like help us to make informed decisions as it relates to you know, healthcare and to improve outcomes. And so, so at this time, we're, we're starting to work with different, I would say, again, say smaller organizations that are, again, you know, faster to move in this space than maybe some of the larger, you know, organizations where, where uh, it would get, it would take a little bit more time to, to move. But the risk for us that actually comes with that is that uh, we, because our, our data is so rich and, it, and it, it's very valuable that we have to work with organizations who we know that one, the, the data doesn't like, it doesn't go from being our data to their data, you know, once it's in their environment, but also that if they do something wrong with the data that they have, can, like, what, kind of, what type of protections do we have? Right? When we're a multi-billion dollar organization, if something gets out of, in the wrong space, we're, we have some pretty big issues there. So it's this balance of how do we leverage those who can move faster with the risk of if they're moving fast but aren't dealing with it well, how do we kind of blend that? 
But we're, but we're definitely in that environment where we're seeing how we can leverage that in a, in a broader way. I would say the Gen AI piece, because it is fairly new, that we're, we're starting to get our hands in there and see how, how is it best leveraged in, that, in our environment. Lisa, anything else? I think it's just important to, if we stick with the Gen AI conversation a little bit longer, it's important to get out and, and play in a safe sandbox, and that's what we did yesterday right. afternoon here at Digital. Um, and, and exploring some of the use cases that are in the toolkit that CPA.com has developed. So, A, understanding that your technology partners are spending a lot of time and a lot of money thinking about AI and how it's going to integrate into the platforms they're going to roll out to you. But also, just spending some time every week getting your hands a little dirty in a, in a safe environment. So, for us, it is a, an enterprise version of um, a, a chat function that I can test some things out in. No, no um, sensitive data, but it's, it's helping me be more efficient in writing up notes from a minute, uh, from a meeting, download a transcript, put that into the chat function and, and get the notes and get the action items clearly articulated to share out. So just thinking about a bite at a time and, and not getting overwhelmed in all of the possibilities and the hour by hour changes in um, developments in Gen AI to make it a little more comfortable back to the um, Lotus to Excel to, you know, the, the environment that we're in today. It can, it doesn't have to be scary. So, so Barry, and th thanks, Lisa. When there's quite a lot of questions have come in that I think we can answer through that toolkit. I mean, people asking questions like, you know, I'm on chat GPT-3. It's, it's based on 2021 data. Well, we talked yesterday about you can pay for chat GPT-4 and it's $20 a month. Uh, and that's probably a smart decision, but you're also probably going to be looking at more enterprise commercial versions, and you've got Microsoft Copilot. So lots of lots of things you need to think through. And again, if you're very, if you're a smaller firm, let the solution providers kind of help out here. And these aren't things that you need to solve by yourself. Even large firms are not solving any of this by yourself. Partnering has never been more important. Barry, we're we're gonna we've got some really good resources we're gonna review in a minute, but just maybe. Uh, some additional reflections from you on digital CPA community and just the dialogue you're having with the membership here and the, and the role this this group of a thousand plus is playing for the profession. Yeah, I, I, I think there was two main points that I would make on that. One, the, the passion and the energy inside the firms, you know, thousands of firms that are that sort of come to digital CPA to look at emerging areas to create opportunities for staff to change the, the sort of relationship in, in services with clients. I think it's, it's just really, really significant. And the firms that come to a function like this, their, their feedback is just invaluable because they're experimenting with different things, you know, where partnering has worked and where it has not worked, and uh, all of those types of things that are really, really uh, critical. On the generative AI part as it relates to the profession, which is not just this conference, but we talked about it, you and I, Eric, at yesterday in a session. Um, you know, we have, Sukofi and I have gone to our technical committees. It's very important that our technical standards evolve um, with an agility to them. Yes, they need to be thought through well, but how things get done is going to be very much different in the future, even in an audit. So for instance, just with generative AI, one of the key components in an audit is in the planning process and understanding risk, as an example. Because we, how is your client using AI? Do, are, they, are they using AI and they don't even realize that they're using AI? What, you know, what are you looking at from an evidence perspective? There's something in AI called hallucinations in which AI makes up information uh, under certain facts and circumstances. How does that play out in an evidence-based role in the public interest in an audit environment? Um, and, and we all have seen on television or whatever where AI has mimic documents and mimic voices and things of that nature. And so as we think about a profession that evolves in an, in an artificial intelligence world, um, at a, particularly with generative AI, um, it has a ramification on our services. The subtext of that is there are going to be services in AI as well. So we've talked about services in ESG and assurance. Assurance services, our sweet spot. It doesn't matter whether you agree with environmental issues or not. It's a sweet spot. What's well, the same thing with AI? There are going to be compliance requirements with AI that fit to the profession. Th thanks, Barry. Um, 
so much to talk about, it, th and, and that's very important leadership uh, that you and Sue are providing to the technical committees. So I want to thank uh, Okori and Lindsay for being with us, and, and thank you uh, also for kicking off that podcast series with us. Thank you. Welcome. Thank so you. Lisa, there we go. It's <laughs> great having a live audience. <laughs> So with that, Lisa and I are going to uh, review some, some materials. And here are all you, these links here. You can access um, a lot about the, the future of audit. The future of audit is now um, the, the huge DAS initiative that we're, we're leading. A lot about the future of client advisory services, an eight-page uh, document that gives you a good overview of many of the strategies of winning firms. There's an ESG document uh, coming out soon. Uh, here's the Generative AI Toolkit. We've talked about this in past town halls. Here are the links on, on how to download it. There's also these practical use case videos that give you some insights on how people are leveraging it. We've got... We've yeah, got, really quickly, I'll just remind you about the resources that are being developed to help firms with the strategy conversations that we talked about earlier, with the culture conversations that we talked about earlier adapting to a changing landscape. So um, we've got plenty of resources out there for you now and are continuing to de develop those. So we'll be with you next on December 21st, back at our usual time, Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, thank you. I know there was questions that came in related to today's Supreme Court case. Uh, we will cover that and we will also put something out in our newsletter next week about uh, our thoughts related to those discussions. And we'll be kicking off the new year on January 4th um, with you. So thanks again. Thanks uh, to the live audience here. Thanks to the virtual digital CPA attendees. And thanks to the 8,000 uh, town hall attendees. And I want to mention one attendee that came in, Barry and Lisa. Uh, he came in from New Zealand. And he said, at 7 AM tomorrow there. So thank <laughs> you. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.